In this presentation, we will discuss how cold environmental conditions may affect athletes. The objectives of this presentation are to describe the epidemiology of cold injuries and different methods of heat loss. We will define each type of cold injury and outline risk factors for cold injury. We will review current guidelines for management of cold injuries and discuss considerations for athletic trainers dealing with athletes exercising in the cold. Mountaineers are at a high risk for cold injuries, with 3-5% to of all injuries to mountaineers being cold-related. Nordic skiers are also at risk for cold injury, with 20% of all Nordic skiers having experienced a cold injury of some sort. In the military, cold injuries occur at a rate of 0.2 to 336 per thousand exposures. There are four main methods of heat loss from the body. They are conduction, convection, radiation, and evaporation. Conduction is the loss of heat through direct contact with an object. In this picture, it is through the man's contact with the ground. Convection is the loss of heat as air passes over the body, lifting away heat. Convection in this picture occurs as the wind blows the warm air near the man's skin away from his body. Radiation occurs through infrared dissipation of heat and is independent of ambient temperature and is increased over exposed areas of skin. In this picture, the man is losing heat through the uncovered area on his face and head. Evaporation occurs through vaporization of water from skin surface, such as sweat evaporation. This is most effective when cooling the body during exercising in warm weather and is less effective in cold environments. There are four main types of cold injuries. Hypothermia, which can be broken into mild, moderate, or severe, depending on the degree of core body temperature decrease. Frostbite, which can be broken into superficial, mild, or deep, depending on the depth of tissues affected. Chilblain and immersion foot, also referred to as trench foot. Hypothermia is defined as a decrease in body temperature below 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius. Mild hypothermia is considered a drop in temperature between 95 and 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Moderate hypothermia is considered a drop in temperature between 90 and 94 degrees Fahrenheit. And severe hypothermia is considered a drop in temperature below 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Hypothermia is a global response to cold, thus the drop in core body temperature. Hypothermia results after exposure to cold, wet, and windy conditions. Those most at risk for hypothermia are those athletes and occupations who are exposed to these conditions. Mountaineers, hikers, military personnel, electricians who are working on power lines, or anyone at an outdoor event. Life signs may be difficult to discern in a person experiencing moderate or severe hypothermia. Therefore, the saying, a person is not dead until they are warm and dead, has been adopted. When a person is found unresponsive with hypothermia, they are promptly warmed before officially being pronounced dead due to hypothermia. Some unresponsive individuals may be resuscitated even after experiencing very severe hypothermia. Frostbite is the actual freezing of tissues and is a local response to cold rather than hypothermia's global response to cold. Human tissue freezes when it reaches temperatures below 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Frostbite results as the body attempts to keep the core essential organs warm by shunting blood from the extremities to the core of the body, thus resulting in a local loss of blood flow and warmth to the extremities. Frostbite progresses from distal to proximal for this reason. Frostbite progresses in stages from frost nip or superficial to mild to severe. Frost nip is superficial frostbite that only involves freezing of the superficial skin. Mild frostbite is slightly deeper and involves freezing of the skin and the directly adjacent subcutaneous tissue. Severe frostbite involves freezing of the skin, subcutaneous tissue, and tissue below that, including muscles, nerves, bones, tendons, and ligaments. Chilblain is an inflammatory response to the cold and moisture exposure. Prolonged vasoconstriction from shunting blood to the core results in hypoxemia and vessel wall inflammation. For this reason, it is not uncommon for chilblain to accompany frostbite. 
As with frostbite, the most distal extremities, the hands and feet, are most at risk. Chilblain is a superficial condition with relatively no long-lasting effects. The major difference between chilblain and frostbite is duration. Frostbite is more common at shorter exposures and lower temperatures. In contrast, chilblain is more common with longer exposures at slightly higher temperatures. Immersion foot results from prolonged exposure of the feet to cold and wet conditions. The term trench foot was coined during World War II to name a condition experienced by armed forces engaged in trench warfare. The trenches were often very wet and muddy on the bottom, and oftentimes the soldiers kept the same pair of boots on all hours of the day, resulting in trench foot. Trench foot affects deeper tissues, including both nerves and blood vessels. It is recommended to apply antiperspirants to the feet to prevent moisture from perspiration when wearing waterproof boots for hiking and mountaineering. Some other cold-related injuries not covered in detail in this presentation include cold urticaria and cold-induced bronchoconstriction. Cold urticaria is a rapid onset of itching, redness, and swelling of skin within minutes of cold exposure. This may cause anaphylactic shock and require the use of an EpiPen. This condition may be hereditary or acquired, and different types may present different clinically. Cold-induced bronchoconstriction is the transient narrowing of airways caused by exercise resulting in asthma-like symptoms. This is typically made worse in cold and dry conditions, such as those found in an ice rink. Prolonged exposure, as seen in some Arctic sled dogs, may result in remodeling of airways and chronic inflammation. However, this response has not been studied in humans. Populations most at risk for cold injuries are those who participate in activities that occur in cold conditions. Military personnel, outdoor sports including late fall sports and early spring sports, explorers and hikers, swimming, especially outdoor swimmers, as well as hockey players who regularly exercise in a cold and very dry ice rink. Risk factors for cold injuries can be broken into environmental and non-environmental risk factors. Environmental risk factors include decreased air temperature, humidity, rain or water immersion, limited sun exposure, wind, and increased altitude. Non-environmental risk factors include history of previous cold injury, which increases risk by two to four times, nicotine, alcohol, or drug use. Nicotine results in a reflexive vasoconstriction, limiting cold-induced central vasodilation, preventing heat loss. Alcohol reduces blood glucose, which decreases normal shivering response, and drugs such as depressants alter vascular response and shivering response. Other risk factors include body composition, aerobic fitness, gender, total heat loss is greater in women typically, clothing which traps warm air and can protect against wind, rain, um, and snow. Low caloric intake, dehydration, fatigue, and race are all risk factors for cold injury. Management of cold injuries begins with prevention. Then, once exposed, recognition of the injury is essential, and then subsequent treatment in response to the injury. Prevention begins with a pre-participation examination. This exam should include questions about prior exposure to cold injuries, as this is a major risk factor for subsequent injury. Some research suggests that acclimatization to the cold may be beneficial for those participating in activities in the cold. However, there has been no explicit plan proposed or evidence to support its usefulness. Clothing should be multi-layered. The first layer closest to the body should be moisture wicking to keep the skin dry. The second layer should be insulating in order to trap warm air close to the body. The outside layer should be rain and wind resistant. Those exposed to cold environments should be allowed to take adequate breaks for rewarming, and if conditions warrant, events may need to be canceled or rescheduled. Finally, education of parents, athletes, coaches, referees, and administration is paramount for ensuring safe exposure to cold for athletes. Similar to the use of the wet bulb globe thermometer in hot environments, we use a chart to calculate wind chill in cold environments. Since both decreased temperature and wind 
compound to create a cold environment and increased risk for cold injury, wind chill is calculated to estimate the actual cold exposure based on temperature and wind speed. The International Olympic Committee has a policy for open water swimming in order to prevent cold injury in swimmers. The water temperature is measured one meter below the surface and must be at or above 16 degrees Celsius for competition to take place. However, athlete perception of acceptable or safe water temperatures may vary, and some events that have taken place at 16 degrees Celsius have been perceived as too cold to compete, and some athletes have experienced cold injuries in these conditions. For this reason, this standard may require future review and modification. Recognition of cold-related injury is essential for anyone who may have contact with an athlete who is exposed to the cold. This includes the athletes themselves, their parents, coaches, and referees who may also experience cold injury. Hypothermia involves shivering, decreased blood pressure, and decreased core temperature. Fine motor skills will be impaired and the individual may be lethargic or experience amnesia. They may also experience cardiac irregularities and slurred speech. Numbness is the first sign of frostbite. Later, followed by edema, redness, mottling of the skin, stiffness, tingling, or burning, and lack of elastic recoil of the skin. Chill blains should be suspected if exposure is greater than 60 minutes at less than 50 degrees Fahrenheit and will result in the appearance of small papules, edema, tenderness, itching, and pain. Trench foot will present with burning and tingling in the exposed foot with loss of sensation. The foot will appear cyanotic or blotchy. The foot may swell and be very painful with skin fissuring as well. Treatment of cold injury depends on the condition, but as a general rule, the goal is to rewarm the affected tissue. Hypothermia requires rewarming the trunk, axilla, groin, and chest wall to affect global core body temperature. The individual should be covered and removed from the cold, wet conditions. Avoid massage as this may damage affected tissues. Frostbite requires a slow rewarming of tissues, ideally with warm water immersion. If warm water immersion is not available, do not use steam or dry heat. If there is the possibility of refreezing, the rewarming process should be delayed as refreezing can be very deleterious to the affected tissue. As with hypothermia, massage should be avoided in order to protect the affected tissue's integrity. Chillblain requires the athlete's removal from the cold environment and the application of warm and dry clothing. It is important to protect the affected skin and avoid weight bearing on the affected limbs as well. Trench foot should be dried and cleaned and warm packs should be applied to the foot for rewarming. Socks and shoes should be replaced. Athletic trainers caring for athletes who may be exposed to cold conditions should be especially aware of the signs and symptoms and treatment methods for cold injuries. It is important to identify those at risk prior to exposure and educate everyone involved in the athletic event about the risks and key identifiers of cold injuries. It is important to monitor weather conditions, especially as the sun sets or wind picks up. As with any significant injury, it is important to be prepared with the appropriate resources for treatment and prevention and notify all appropriate resources prior to a possible cold exposure. There may be a place for acclimatization to cold, however, this is not well, as well supported as heat acclimatization programs. Finally, as an athletic trainer, do not forget to protect yourself and others not participating directly in the sport. Athletes will be exercising and generating much more body heat for protection than those standing on the sidelines exposed to the same dangerous conditions. Keep in mind yourself, coaches, fans, photographers, cheerleaders, reporters, who may all experience cold injury at an athletic event you are responsible for. The International Olympic Committee, National Athletic Trainers Association, American Physical Therapy Association, as well as the American College of Sports Medicine are all good resources for further research on cold injuries.